Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. Did you know that over one third of American adults are nearsighted? And that number is going up dramatically uh, here over the last couple of decades. We're going to talk to you today about a very interesting uh, new study that's getting started soon. where are looking to try to delay the onset of nearsightedness by using eye drops with kids. And today we're talking with one of the researchers involved in this project, Dr. Jeff Walleen, a professor from The Ohio State University. So Dr. Walleen, I guess for people that don't know, what exactly is nearsightedness? Yeah, so nearsightedness is basically when your eye grows too long and that causes light to focus in front of the retina or the seeing part of the eye. And when that happens, you have trouble seeing things far away clearly, unless you wear glasses or contact lenses. That's what we use to then, or even get refractive surgery. Those are the things that we do to try and give you clear vision, make light focus right on the retina. You know, I, I didn't realize this, this is kind of interesting that we're born farsighted, but then as we get older, we become a little more nearsighted. Is there a certain age that this starts to develop more? Yeah, it typically starts to develop around age eight to 10 years old and it tends to get worse through about age 15 or 16. However, having said that, there's a lot of variability around that. Uh, you know, my own personal example, I became nearsighted when I was 16 years old. So there's a lot of variability, but the typical is from about age eight or 10 to about 15 or 16, it tends to get worse. So you've already done some very uh, successful research when it comes to contact lenses to kind of slow down the progress. Why is it so important to try to slow down this process or how this myopia or uh, nearsightedness progresses in kids? Yeah, we know that the more nearsighted someone is, the more likely they are to have sight-threatening complications, mostly as adults. The complications that we might get are retinal detachment, so that seeing part of the eye comes off the back of the eye and you can no longer see through it. You might get choroidal atrophy, which basically causes blind spots in your vision. You're more likely to get cataracts, glaucoma. So lots of different diseases that even if we give you glasses or contact lenses, they don't necessarily help your vision. So we're really trying to avoid those things later in life. But Right away, the benefits that we see are um, you basically have more treatments available to you with lower amounts of nearsightedness and more options available to you at a lower cost. So that's one of the just it's a more simple benefit. It's not quite the sight saving benefit, but really it can make things just easier to, um, to get treatments for if you have less nearsightedness. So is this something that only progresses while our eyes are growing as we're a kid? For the most part, um, it really primarily progresses in those ages like eight to 16. However, a number of people also become nearsighted at that college age. Um, and a few even become nearsighted as older adults. But for the most part, the vast majority of people who are nearsighted, you said one out of every three, and about 60% of those became nearsighted when they were in those ages of eight to 16 years old. So there's already been some research to show that the medicine uh, atropine will uh, help after someone gets nearsightedness, slow it down. What is your new uh, research study looking to do with this atropine? Yeah, we want to actually try to delay the onset of nearsightedness, and that can have several benefits. First of all, kids won't need to wear glasses as early as they would have naturally. Probably the more important benefit is we know that the earlier myopia onsets the more likely you are to have higher myopia as an adult. And so if we can just delay that onset, we think as an adult, you'll have less myopia and therefore less of a risk of those sight-threatening complications we talked about earlier. So ultimately, that's what our goal is. So how, how would people know if the, their kid may be more prone to have nearsightedness or is there a test that they can do to figure that out? Yeah, so one way is if, there are two myopic parents, your child is much more likely to be nearsighted themselves. And by myopic, I mean nearsighted. If there's one um, nearsighted parent, there are less than two nearsighted parents, but still more than no nearsighted parents. So I'd say nearsighted parents or children with nearsightedness, their siblings are more likely to become nearsighted. But the way we determine it is by measuring the prescription of the eye. If you're close to the myopia cliff, then we can give you eye drops to try and delay the onset of myopia. And we can tell with about 90% accuracy who's going to become nearsighted by eighth grade. 
So I, I love studies that give good acronyms and yours may be one of the best. So tell us what the, the donut part of your study, what donut means. Yeah, donut stands for delaying the onset of nearsightedness until treatment. And one of my colleagues' name is Don. And I didn't want to call it the Don study because that would give him too much credence. Um, so we just we went with donut because a it's much more fun and interesting for kids. But we've also had studies that have been cookie clamp. Um, we've we've got lots of achieve study. We've got lots of fun study names because honestly, it helps recruit kids. Yeah, that, that is awesome. So one thing that I always find interesting in medicine is how you can get a different drug that can do a lot of different things. So People may not know atropine is the same stuff that you get put in your eye when you get an eye exam to dilate your pupil. How, how does this, and I know you're using a much smaller amount or diluted amount, how does this help slow down uh, nearsightedness? It, I wish we knew the answer to that, to be perfectly honest. What was believed when many, many years ago was that it not only dilates your pupil, but it makes it so you can't focus your eyes for up close. And we thought that focusing your eyes for up close was what made people nearsighted. This was many years ago, we used to believe that. And so we thought that's how it worked, but it turns out that's not true. What we believe is it's some receptors in the retina that ultimately make you um, less likely to become nearsighted, but we don't know ultimately how they work. So unfortunately, we don't know the actual mechanism of how it works, but we do know that it has been effective for slowing the progression of nearsightedness. And studies in Asia have shown that it's effective at delaying the onset of nearsightedness. So we've got to study that in children in the United States. Uh, that, that's that's really interesting. So, uh, you know, you were talking about the uh, not only just the the sight issues it helps, but just the economic issues. I didn't realize how big of an economic issue this is when it comes to nearsightedness. Yeah, it, and and to be honest, the cost of the disease isn't all that significant. It's just that so many people have it that it costs our healthcare system a lot of money. And so anything we can do to try and delay the onset of nearsightedness will help with those just those healthcare costs for society in general. Um, and then ultimately reducing those site threatening risks will help benefit individuals, but also our society as a whole in terms of reducing costs. Well, Dr. Walling, a very interesting uh, study y'all got going. Best of luck with it. Hopefully you get some good success, but thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, and thank you for uh, the invitation. Appreciate it.